Well, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I'm Merit Jano, Dean of SEPA, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you here today for all the people who are with us, and also I believe we are live streaming this event uh, for uh, those who couldn't be with us. This is the second in our series at SEPA of what we're calling the Dean Seminar on Race and Policy. And we launched this at the beginning of the year as a way to more deeply engage prominent authors, scholars, commentators, and civic leaders in an ongoing public seminar about race, injustice, and public policy. And this is intended as a forum for discussion about the challenges related to race and public policy, and also to have us think together about policy responses that can be undertaken both domestically and internationally to increase awareness and address um, problems that exist in all societies. The first speaker in the series was Patricia Williams, a distinguished professor at Columbia Law School and a prominent author who spoke on January 28th about the death of contingency, risk, race, and rue, a very elegant presentation that you will also see on our website. And in February, SIPA co-hosted a forum on police community relations with the Amadou Diallo Foundation, and we've had ongoing meetings and activities this spring as part of our diversity task force. Today, we are really pleased and honored to have with us Ben Jealous, a remarkable civil rights leader, author, a very noted Columbia graduate, and our second speaker in this series. Ben Jealous was the former president and CEO of the NAACP. He was the youngest president of the NAACP in its history appointed at the age of 35. Well, it's amazing. I won't tell you when that was. Uh, uh, during his tenure, he helped grow the NAACP to become the largest civil rights organization, both online and across mobile platforms, and indeed the largest community-based nonpartisan voter registration operation in the country with more than a million activists. He also increased the NAACP's programs related to the environment, to health, the economy, and education, among many other areas. Prior to becoming the president, he was an investigative journalist and a community organizer. He's been a leader of successful state and local movements to ban the death penalty, outlaw racial profiling, defend voting rights, secure marriage equality, and end mass incarceration remarkable record. He was a Rhodes Scholar and named by both Forbes and Time Magazine to their top 40 under 40 lists and a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. He's also the author of a new book entitled Reach, 40 Black Men Speak on Living, Leading, and Succeeding, which features personal essays from prominent figures in the black community. I hope you'll tell us a little bit more about that. And he recently joined the Silicon Valley venture capital firm, Caper Capital, where he plans to continue his goal of growing opportunities for minorities in the tech economy. We're really excited to have you here today and to share your views on a talk he entitled At the Intersection of Tech and Social Impact. And let me just say, Ben, that this uh, combination is something that is really appropriate for SEPA today. We've launched our own tech and policy initiative that's very much focused on issues around using technology to have an impact on public policy, as well as undertaking research in areas uh, that involve tech policy. So thank you very much for making time to be with us. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Jeno. Thank you, everybody. It's nice to see so many fellow Colombians and old friends and colleagues. I'm going to talk today, I guess I'll talk for about 20 minutes or so, and then really want to take questions and kind of get into it. So please be thinking about what you want to talk about. I want to start my comments uh, when I was a student here, uh, 21 years ago, exactly half a lifetime ago. I'm now 42. And, um, it was a friend's 21st birthday party. Uh, we were across the way. A round of toasts went up. First was to our friend for turning 21. And then 
overwhelmed with sadness, a friend went to raise a toast and just began to pour libations of memory to all of our friends who had died, shot and killed, were sent to prison before we got to college. And then trying to, move, to turn the mood around, Fred raised his glass and chose the fact that one more of us had survived to 21. And these were the days, Kevin recalls, these were the days when there were nightly shootouts in Morningside Park. You could watch them, actually, from the dorms or even probably from this building. That one more of us had survived to 21. That one more young man of color, one more black man in America had survived to 21. I couldn't raise my glass on that third toast. The motion cut me like a knife. The notion that somebody thought it an achievement in this country, the world's wealthiest, most powerful democracy, little, you know, for any men of any group, let alone for their own group, let alone for my group, to simply survive past one's 20 first birthday, breathe a day past 21. Some would think that would be an accomplishment. Sent me reeling. And I ultimately did what I'm so blessed to be able to do. My grandmother's turning 99 this November. She's the granddaughter of slaves. Her grandfather was born a slave, died a state senator, co-founded Virginia State University along the way. And when you grow up in a family like that, white or black, you carry those stories with you. They're simply too important to forget. And so my grandmother carries now about 200 years of stories, the century almost of history she has witnessed and the century that her grandparents and their grandparents witnessed and handed down. And so I went right to her table. She was living in South Jersey, exit zero, Cape May. And I just put my burden on her table, and I said, Grandma, what happened? You said that our generation, that my generation, that those of us who were born after the March on Washington, that we were the children of the dream, that we just simply had to reap what you all had sown, that you had killed Jim Crow just like your grandparents had killed his daddy, slavery. That all we had to do was keep our nose clean and walk a straight line, and everything would be okay. And Grandma, you know, that's worked for me, and it's worked for many of us. But I dare say I don't think it's worked for most of us. Because I live in a place called Harlem, and I went to school in a little town called Seaside, a Title I school that was rated 1 on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 was not a good thing. And in places like that, Grandma, and in this country as a cold, will, will my generation, these so-called children of the dream, these first children born outside of segregation, we have become the most murdered generation in the country and the most incarcerated generation on the planet. What happened, Grandma? She got real quiet and she said, you know, it's, it's, it's sad, but it's simple. We got what we fought for, but we lost what we had. We got what we fought for, but we lost what we had. We got the right to live in any neighborhood in which we could afford to live. Black people in America, we lost 500, 500 to 1,000 acres per day from the start of World War II until the end of the Cold War. And it only went down in recent decades because there was not much land left to lose. We got the right to be police officers. My grandfather was in law enforcement in Baltimore for 30 years. We lost the right to live in safe communities. We got the right to be teachers in any school in town. We lost the right to assume that our children would be loved and welcomed wherever school they went, the way that my grandmother was in that one-room schoolhouse that her grandfather had built for his children and the neighborhood children uh, at the end of slavery. That story really galvanized me. I, um, it really was the beginning of me switching my focus um, from heading towards Wall Street, which is what I came to Columbia University to do, to heading into the family business, which had been civil rights, uh, from the very end of the Civil War, uh, from, frankly, focusing my years, 20s and 30s, on making money to focus on making change. 
But when you decide, when you figure out, as I did, that literally every generation of my family since before the end of slavery had been trained to fight, and that mine was not well, the first that was not. We were the first that was told it was an, an option. My mom had sued her, her, her future high school when she was 12 to gain entry, and she desegregated it in 1955. Baltimore de delayed a year, so they didn't desegregate in 54, for instance. My grandmother had gone down to the, to the uh, uh, school district office that was named for her black grandfather who had given the land to start the public school systems in Dinwiddie County, but w had been taken over by a Jim Crow government that insisted on blacks coming through the back door. And she, as a teacher, risked her job and said, no, I'm going to come through the front door because my grandfather's name's over it, and demand the, the chalkboard that she needed for her classrooms because her chalkboard didn't retain chalk. And there was no way to teach children to read back then unless your chalkboard could retain chalk, or at least not to write. And so they were all fighters, and they had been taught to fight out of necessity. And it got to mine, and it was optional. And I decided that night I would fight. And two things happened. One, which takes us in a very different direction that I won't talk about today, which was just figuring out what I would fight for. The other was really understanding how to fight. When you look at people like Senator Bland, my grandmother's grandfather who was born a slave and died a state senator and co-founded Virginia State University, or Peter G. Morgan, my grandfather's great-grandfather, who was born a slave, purchased half of his children out of slavery, but the slave owners would not let him negotiate for the other half, freed them in the house my mom was born in, Petersburg, Virginia, co-founded a bank, first uh, class of black Reconstruction statesmen in Virginia, um, and uh, one of the few black co-signers of the Reconstruction Constitution in Virginia. When you look at men like that, or you simply look at Frederick Douglass himself, who we know as the kind of father of black republicanism, the father of the civil rights movement, also the head of the Freedmen's Bank. What you see is they brought their whole selves to the table every day. There was no bifurcation. There was no, I make money over here and then I volunteer my time to do good over here. It was, I do good in whatever I do. If I am running a school or creating a school, it is to advance the uh, opportunity for my community. If I'm founding and operating a bank, it is to advance the opportunity for my community. If I'm operating a farm, it is to employ and advance opportunity for my community. And yes, if I'm in office and I'm advocating or I'm an activist, well, that is for the same purpose. And that really kind of hit me when I came out of the NAACP. You know, I was in a weird place. Like, I started in the mailroom of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund when I was 18 years old. Uh, Jack Greenberg, who was the dean of Columbia College at the time, he was the hand-picked successor of Thurgood Marshall at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Before that, one of the great civil rights lawyers at our time, of our time, 20th century. Uh, was now dean of Columbia College, and he arranged me to, to do my, my, my work study down there, and that got my start. And I was walking with a friend on a beach in Martha's Vineyard, writing, literally I'd gone up to his house to write my farewell letter to the NAACP. And he said, Ben, what are you going to do next? I said, you know, I really have no idea. I said, man, look, I was, I was born in an, in an army town. I was raised in an, in an army town. Monterey, California is an army town. We have Four Door, which was the big rapid deployment base during the Cold War for the infantry on the West Coast. We have a Naval Postgraduate School. We have a Coast Guard base. We have Fort Hunter Liggett. We were just a military town. I said, and so the only metaphor I have to figure out what to do when you sign up for battle when you're 18 and you come out uh, a, you know, having been the leader of the troops at... 40 are the guys I know who went into the Army at 18 and came out as officers when they were 40 with their retirement. So the difference is that when you're, the troops you were leading were civil rights activists, there is no retirement. And, uh, and so, um, you know, but I guess I'll just do what, um, what they did. And ultimately, you know, he said, well, what are you thinking? I said, well, I'm not going to become a doctor. Uh, I'm not going to go to law school. I said, maybe I'll get my MBA. Um, and I was thinking about teaching someplace at the time and perhaps taking some courses across the street. And so he said, well, he said, Ben, you know, that makes sense. He said, you know, I'm, um, you could, you could uh, 
Uh, well, you could pay with your money or your time. You could pay to go get an MBA. He said, or you could just recognize that you've been CEO of something since you were 26. You've managed complex organizations for a long time. And, and you know, whatever you don't know about investing, I'd be happy to teach you. Well, why was this interesting to me? A person who was talking to me was a man named Mitch Kapoor. Mitch had found his Lotus, uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3, Lotus Notes, in probably 1983. It was the killer app for, small, well, for businesses of any size during the PC era. It's why small businesses bought computers in the early 1980s. For the last 30 years, he had been an uh, angel investor, a venture capitalist in the Silicon Valley. Honestly, none of that really interested me that much. I had offers like that when I graduated from Columbia. I had offers you know, kind of in that line when I came back from being a Rhodes. What interested me was that two years earlier, Mitch had decided that he was bored. Even being an angel investor, you literally figure out how to grow money on trees, sixth investor in Uber, you know, things like that. Now the valuation of Uber is $40 billion. Um, and he decided that uh, it just simply wasn't worth doing anymore if he could not remain a top quartile Silicon Valley venture capitalist leader of a top quartile Silicon Valley venture capitalist company while practicing his values fully, while moving the portfolio to 100% social impact startups. He reasoned that if he could do that, then you actually had a success story that was a, an indictment of capitalism as practiced by most. In other words, the lie we believe that capitalists tell ourselves is that we must exploit people, degrade the planet, and destabilize communities in order to make a, a profit. That was exciting to me. When you go back to Frederick Douglass, when you go back to the Frederick Douglass of our family, Peter G. Morgan, who started that bank, these were men who sought to change the world by being like water. If they could advance change by running for office, they ran for office. If they could advance change by leading a movement, they led a movement. If they could advance change by starting a business, or in the case of the bank, investing, starting a business and investing in other businesses, well, then they did that. And they often did all of them. And so I waited in. I told Mitch, I'll give you 20% of my time. I have some other things I want to do. I was thinking about teaching, like I said. And so, He says, well, let me pull together some of the founders of these startups so you can get a sense of them. And I find myself at a table. And around the table are people who have started ed tech companies. There's a guy who started a company to uh, kind of zero in on to compete with payday lenders and to try to disrupt that market. Well, that's interesting to me. I, um, first year at the NAACP, we had held outlaw payday lending in two states. Uh, I believe it was Ohio and Arizona, grossly contained the industry. For that, a good friend of mine who's a leader based in North Carolina um, was greeted by two very big men in his parking garage and beaten within an inch of his life. Payday lending industry uh, is often led by criminals, just straight up. It is licensed. It is... It is loan sharking under the color of law, although in some states it's much more expensive than loan sharking. Uh, loan sharks, when I used to work for a, a, harm reduction, a harm reduction housing provider in New York City, loan sharks uh, charge 10% simple interest a week. So like, you know, 520% or so a year. Um, in Missouri, payday lenders charge 1,475%. So somebody wanted to disrupt payday lending figure out how to develop an, uh, an independent credit rating for people who are using payday lending, that was interesting to me. The fact that they were getting traction was interesting to me. Um, the fact that they were starting at a relatively high interest rate, I understood because I had looked at how to disrupt it through kind of more tra tra traditional bo uh, business models, but that rate was always less than half. In the case of Missouri, it was like an, an eighth of what people had been paying the day before. And they created a uh, credit rating system that would get people down to under 20% relatively quickly. They continued to, to make their payments. So he had my attention. And then I'd say I just kind of fell in love. See, one of the issues I've been working on, and I've been a criminal justice reform advocate now for more than two decades, and all throughout that time was trying to figure out 
how to keep families intact by making it cheaper to call home. When you sit, uh, you know, you walk right down to 125th Street where I used to, uh, I started a free childcare program when I was in um, college as part of something called the Harlem Restoration Project Youth Corps. You sit with the children and they miss their fathers. The way that if any of you have children, your children would miss you if you were suddenly gone to Sing Sing or wherever. But when you sit with the men in prisons, wherever I've gone, they miss their children. And what's in between, yeah, walls and barbed wire, but most immediately is a phone that can cost, depending on where you are, up to $3 a minute to call home. And when your wife or your partner or your baby mama or whatever, the relationship may be and whatever, however you re re refer to each other, is surviving on, say, less than $18,000 a year, and a phone call from dad may cost $30, it quickly becomes, do we, have, do we pick up that phone or do we feed the kids? And sitting right there was a guy named Frederick Hudson. He has a company called Pigeon Lee. It just came through Y Combinator last week. There's good media on NPR website and TechCrunch about it if you want to check it out. Frederick had written the business plan for Pigeon Lee from his prison where he was incarcerated at approximately age 24 for marijuana distribution. Job, it's highly legal in Colorado and a few other places right now, but was not in his state at the time. He, uh, he had been a serial entrepreneur before prison. He had been in the Air Force. He had not graduated from college. He got a, a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. He read everything he could on business, and he wrote business plans every day he was in prison. And then he took them all with him to the halfway house. And then he called up his first venture capitalist from his bed on a smuggled in cell phone at the halfway house, because they were not allowed to make phone calls from the halfway house. And he pitched them. And he sold them on an idea which was, first, um, a way to just simply get photos into prisons cheaply and in a way that they could be received. Because he had worked in the mailroom and seen all the thousands of photos thrown away because they did not come in in the proper way. So this way, you could use a service, access it on mobile or from your computer, and send your loved one a photo of the kids or of yourself or whomever, and know it would get to them, have the best chance to get to them, and it would be cheaper. It was called Photo Pigeon. And then he got a special exemption from the FCC and a special exemption from the Bureau of Prisons to disrupt the prison phone call racket and drop the cost and this is in the federal system, so I think it's currently still about 80 cents a minute, dropped it by more than 90% on day one. Companies grown at more than 20% a month, more than 60% a quarter, consistently over the last two and a half years. Uh, and it was the buzz uh, when I was just out at Y Combinator, which is the most competitive accelerator and, and uh, demo day in the country. Now, I was excited because all of a sudden I could see the crack for the for the the water to flow through. You see, the way that the payday lending industry responded when we had shut them down in a couple of states is they like quadrupled down on buying the loyalty of state reps and state senators across the country, and it became a very steep climb to try to control them anywhere else. And they also intimidated people, like my friend, uh, who kept fighting. Um, in fact, he got louder, not quieter, but other people took note. And with regards to the, to the prison phone call racket, well, I've been hitting my head against the walls kind of in an odd rhythm for, you know, off and on for 20 years, and we have made very little progress. FCC is making some progress now, still much less than Pigeon Lee has done for the federal system. Um, and basically what they do, the way that they drop the cost, is they take like a Google number. Raise your hand if you have a Google number. Can we hear it? Okay. So... Google numbers, what they allow you to, to, to do, right, like if you have a family member, um, you know, here we now have uh, these kind of unlimited plans for long distance, so it's not as big a deal as if you're in a prison where you're reversing charges and paying per, per minute. But uh, you can take, you can get a number that's like local to Hawaii, um, but connected to your cell phone in New York. So if your friends want to call you on a pay phone from Hawaii, or they've got like cricket or something, and they don't really have long distance, so much they can call you local and get you here. Well, they, they do the same thing. They give you a phone number. The, the area code is local to your prison, 
um, but it's connected to your house. So your prison might be in uh, Connecticut and your house is in Atlanta. You dial a local number that you're now paying for through your commissary account uh, in, in uh, Connecticut and the phone rings in Atlanta. This is the potential, right? This is the opportunity. If you were sitting in a halfway house you know, at this moment in time, if you were sitting in a halfway house 50 years ago, even 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, and you said, you know what? I want to disrupt AT&T. We would just send you back. You might go to the insane asylum, not back to the prison, but we would send you back because you're delusional. But today, they actually have to be worried. They have to be concerned, at least those bottom feeders who are really profiting, and there are a lot, Western Union's a big one, um, who are profiting on, on poor people in very exploitative ways. One of my favorite companies that we've invested in is right up the hill in Washington Heights. It's called Regali. It's founded by Dominican and you know, men who were born in, in the DR and, and in Mexico and migrated here as children. One of them is a former SEIU janitor. And they were upset. They were upset that every time that they sent money home, a, one of a few things could happen. And one thing always happened. What could happen is grandma could be a target now. Because you had to take a bus across town to get to the office of Western, uh, Western uh, Union, typically, or one of their franchisees. Stand in line, the plate glass window on a busy street where she's now a mark, because everybody knows everybody who goes in there walks out with cash in their pocket. Then walk back onto that busy street where somebody may have been walking back and forth and figuring out who the most vulnerable people are and be preyed upon, or if she's not, hop back on that bus and she's now taking a day just to get some money to pay the bills. That's one thing that could happen. She could be, you know, she definitely will lose a day of her life trying to get the money. She may be preyed upon. She may lose the, the cash. Or she may forget to spend it on what it was sent for, the groceries or the power bill. What will definitely happen uh, is that de de depending on the amount, it'll take a haircut, typically between 10 and 30 percent. Just lose 10 to 30 percent of its value just in passing from through Western Union. What Regali decided to do was to basically kind of crack the code on digital gift cards and make it possible for you to buy your grandmother a gift card that could be represented by a barcode on her cell phone that she could use at the grocery store or use with the power company to pay the bill. And all of a sudden, she gets a day of her life back. She gets her dignity back because she doesn't have to stand in that crazy line and bad knees or whatever, sweating in a poorly air-conditioned office, waiting for hours to get her money. She's no longer a mark for somebody who you know, knows she has cash in her pocket. And the money gets spent on exactly what she told you the money would get spent on. It's important, I think, look, I came to this great uni uni university two decades ago with uh, you know, dreams. Um, ultimately decided that it was... Uh, it was a choice between making money and changing the world. It was, uh, uh, and that if I wanted to change the world, the, the, the real possibilities, possibilities to do that were ultimately either through direct advocacy or direct service. And it would have to be scaled, in other words, typically through philanthropy. Maybe self-interest, small dollar stuff like we did with the NAACP, raising money over emails, or uh, you know, philanthropic, people deciding to support other people's causes with large checks. But either way, the opportunities for scaling were inherently li limited. I think what excites me most, and I'll close on this, I'm happy to take questions, about this time in my life, and I'm not done advocating at all, um, but I am trying to be a little bit more like the men I admired most in my family tree and bring my whole self to the table, be present in the world, the business changing the world, be present as I was at the Cut 50 conference last week with Van Jones and Newt Gingrich um, and the Koch Brothers General Counsel trying to figure out how to shrink our 
Penal system. Um, well, what excites me is that now we can scale change through the marketplace as well. And when I say we, I mean we. Uh, not some of us, not the most privileged of us, but we. Um, yeah, uh, the founder of Rug Gali is a Dominican immigrant who ultimately went to Wharton. That's true. But the founder of Pigeon Lee, uh, which at the moment is growing faster, is a black guy who was born here who graduated from prison. And that means that it's really open to all of us in a way that even, quite frankly, the offices of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, where I started my career, weren't quite open to all of us. We were told, if you want to work here, go to a top six law school. If it's top ten, we might talk to you. If it's top six, you'll probably get a job. Uh, this, uh, it, you know, it, in other words, what we're seeing now with startups um, is disruptive in a whole lot of ways, including uh, disrupting the order of who gets to change the world. Thank you. This has been fun talking about. Happy to take questions. Thanks very much. That was a fascinating uh, personal set of remarks. I'm very grateful to you. It, it seems to me that, you know, to have that kind of disruptive influence, you have to have a sense of clear vision yeah. of what you want to do and then have an imagination of what are the problems that technology can help you address. So how do you, how do you tell people, how do you, inf you know, invite uh, that kind of combination to occur? Are you just looking for those in the world who have it or are you trying to stimulate people to be? Oh, both. Yeah. No, both. I mean, I, and I've actually been doing a lot of recruiting of organizers now to go work in startups and trying to get them in very early um, because, you know, if you take uh, somebody who's a great organizer and you put them in a startup that could make great wealth, well, then you might get some very interesting candidates for office. <laughs> and so I have a little project going on, an experiment that I'm running right now. But um, in the demand economy, we actually need organizers. I mean, if you have a community organizing background, I would encourage you to look at the, the next wave of companies that are, that are inspired by Uber, for instance. They have huge regulatory hurdles, uh, and they're also trying to convince working people to kind of shift their patterns of behavior in droves. And for that, the skills of organizers are very valuable. Um, but, you know, the, uh, the most important thing Dean, is that, is that folks um, feel empowered to scratch their own itch. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the real opportunity here. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs scratch their own itch. Uh, our offices are in Oakland, uh, and you can see the Bay Bridge from our offices. On one side of the Bay Bridge is San Francisco, and the other side is Oakland. San Francisco has become almost a, a walled city-state for the rich, and Oakland is very much the opposite. On one side of that bridge, if you have a problem, there's like 10 entrepreneurs scratching that itch. Turns out problems in San Francisco are things like, gee, I really want to mail this glass to my sister, but I just can't get to the UPS store down the street. Oh, I, if I could just click on my mobile phone, somebody will come here, they will wrap it up, and they'll send it to my sister, right? And they better be here in under 30 minutes. There's like 10 different companies trying to do that right now. If you're on the other side of the bridge, um, you know, then it's like, Many of them go through Western Union. Every time I check my, cash my check, they take a bunch of money. Every time I need to pay um, for the commissary for a family member who's incarcerated, they take my money. Every time that I try to mail money back to Mexico, they take my money. And they take a lot of it, and they take too much of it, and I really don't understand why. There's now just starting to be companies really going after all aspects of the Western Union racket. Um, but uh, there are many, many itches that are not scratched. And you know, one of them is a woman named Ana Roca Castro has a com company called Plaza Familia in upstate New York, give you an example. Um, grew up in a tough neighborhood in the city, uh, went to college, found herself raising her daughter. Her daughter was second generation and was getting the benefits of that as far as English as a native language and so forth. But around her, there were a bunch of other Latino kids who were struggling and they were English as a second language, and it looked like they were, on average, about four grade levels behind. And there was nothing, there were all these ed tech companies growing, and there was nothing to really serve them, except for stuff created by corporations where they literally would slap, like, Door the Explorer 
on some inadequate product and marketed it as a feel good and it left you feeling pretty bad because your kid didn't learn too much. And she said there's gotta be a better way. And she created a better way and it's been growing leaps and bounds and she's, we're the only VCs who, who she's taken on. She's been able to almost exclusively self-finance. And that's the opportunity. Uh, when you embrace the wisdom of struggle in this country, um, you may not have entrance into a market in which a small number of people will pay a whole lot of money for something. But you do have entrance into a market where millions of people may pay a very little for something. And they both can be extremely powerful for scaling, for scaling ideas. Well, thank you very much. Let, let's open it up for questions. Could you come up to the microphone and introduce yourself? And while you're doing that, I'll just mention that we introduced a student challenge last year to uh, invite students to be combining technology and urban problem solving. And oh. one of the student teams came up with a very intriguing initiative around remittances. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So I think that uh, financial inclusion, remittances, there's a lot of scope for creativity. There. Well, I, I hope next time you'll, you'll ask me to come. I'd be excited to, to help with the next one. Thank you. Please introduce yeah. yourself. And maybe please. invest. Yeah. Uh, my name is Yash Shah. I'm a oh. first year law student here. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, on Monday, the first woman in U.S. history was charged, convicted, and sentenced of feticide in Indiana. Um, the facts of the case were, was that she induced a miscarriage um, 23 to 25 weeks into the pregnancy. Um, I think this implicates issues of access to health care, advocacy, and women's rights. Can you talk about the prospects and challenges for impact investing to create change on these kinds of issues, specifically you know, technology in minority communities? Sure. I'm not so sure with infanticide and, and abortion. I have to think more about that. But, you know, generally with regards to health and health care and access to good information and decision making, I mean, there's, there's uh, a lot of possibilities. And, you know, Planned Parenthood, for instance, has one of the largest uh, mobile text lists of, of any organization in the country. And a lot of it is young women who are able to text back and forth with them, uh, you know, to answer, you know, to ask, you know, questions that they wouldn't ask anybody else. And you, and you wonder if, if that woman had been on that list, you know, if maybe she would have made a different decision. The, um, again, the, the most powerful sort of um, force for people who are locked out to transform the economy or their lives or the healthcare system through technology is themselves. And uh, I've begun, for instance, to start looking for more and more formerly incarcerated people, women and men returning from prison who have ideas for that general group of people, either inside the prison, outside the prison, but poor folks in our society. Based on my experience, one with Frederick uh, Hudson, the founder of Pigeon Lee, who's in my book, uh, Reach, um, 40 Black Men, on living, leading, and succeeding, he tells his story there. Um, uh, and believe me, there, there might be a pattern there because you know, what you find when you sit around the in investment table, it's like sitting around a poker table. Uh, my uncle was an entrepreneur who entertained himself um, by playing poker at a card house in, in Maryland. And I would go with him uh, just to watch. And uh, the men who you, who you feared at that table tended to be of two types. Either they were rich and often didn't know what they were doing, but they could afford to lose all day and take your money down with them. <laughs> or they were typically poor, and they were the smartest guy at the table, and they had entered with the least amount of money and built a pile of it just by being the smartest person at the table. In the Silicon Valley, that's very much the two most attractive sets of, of entrepreneurs. You have somebody who's had a successful exit, they've won something before, so you're thinking, well, maybe we can, should bet on them again. They have a whole bunch of their own money in the deal, and so it reduces your risk maybe in a couple of ways, but you're not quite sure that, that, that they didn't just experience a, a miracle the first time. Uh, and then you have people like Frederick Hudson who had everything stacked against him, still managed to kind of crack the code. You go to his first board meeting and he performs as if he's a CEO who's come through two successful startups, but in the period that he would have been at those startups, he was at prison and this is his first. And, uh, and you realize, oh, that's just raw talent. Um, and so, you know, my concern 
uh, to put it bluntly, is there may be, and this is as a, as a fifth generation bourgeois Negro, that there might be a, a disconnect between our most privileged people in our community and the ones who are willing to take the most risk. In other words, if we believe that genius is, is, the, is the same across all zip codes, then you know uh, you have as many geniuses per say thousand in uh, the toniest parts of New Rochelle as you do in the poorest parts of Harlem. Well, the kids are kind of the toniest parts of New Rochelle, who are part of the upper middle class, not the really wealthy class. The upper middle class are more likely to be risk averse than the kids who come out of the poorest parts of Harlem. And so, the uh, you know ultimately to succeed in the valley, you've got to have both. And so I spent a lot of time actually just to the encouraging with upper middle class kids who've gone to all the best schools who have a great idea saying, no, the idea has to be bigger, your pace has to be faster, you have to be willing to raise more money, give up more equity, because you know, you're better off having 20% of a billion dollars than 100% of a failed company. And I spent a lot of time with guys coming out of prison saying, let me see your business plan. Let's talk about this. Let's try to figure this out. Because at that card table, um, you know, again, the one I would usually bet on was the equivalent of the guy coming out of prison. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Ava. I'm a second year MPA student at SIPA. Um, it seems to me that there's a natural tension between the desire of venture capitalists to make returns and scale business yep. models and the desire of social entrepreneurs to serve underrepresented, impoverished communities. Can you talk about that tension and I guess how you address it, your firm addresses it? So um, I think any other venture capital firm, they would have been worried when they saw the results of my personality test for the fit in the leadership team. Uh, because of all the things that can motivate you on a scale of, of uh, 100 being the highest and zero being the lowest, money for me, the acquisition of money was a four out of a possible 100. So just, you know, anybody thinks maybe I've just kind of lost my, my mind or I was always motivated by money, I'm still not. What's exciting to us is that everybody else is. And many of those people, when you sit with them at dinner, are a lot better than their investment patterns would suggest they are, right? A lot more interested in kind of, you know, equity and justice than the, what they're investing in. And so we're seeking to kind of leverage ultimately the culture of capitalism um, by proving over the next 10 years, and we're at the, in the second year of it, that you can make very respectable, you know, top quartile type returns investing in making the world healthier, closing racial gaps, closing gaps between the rich and the poor, so like, for instance with health outcomes, you know, closing gaps between the rich and the poor, which is gargantuan, assisting people in uh, more successful reentry, uh, and so forth. And if we do that, then you know, when I'm investing uh, in my 50s, uh, not my 40s, then, then we should have many more allies. And we can really start, you know, the, the danger right in the Silicon Valley within all the diversity conversations have at least shown, you know, Google, you know, Google had protected its diversity numbers, saying that it was a trade secret sued to protect, they had 2% black folks, like 1% Latinos or something, and guess what, so did everybody else, right? So it wasn't a secret, and I don't really understand, you know, the, but anyways, some judge was willing to take that argument. Um, so we would say that what you have in the Valley is not a meritocracy, as they say, but a meritocracy, that people just hire people like them, kind of their dorm room, you know, to the 12th power. Right. Um, well, so, but the other thing is that they say that they're building a utopia, and really, if you look at the decisions that are me being made, they're increasingly <coughs> going to be pointing us towards dystopia. And so that's ultimately what we see as the choice for the, for the Valley. Either we can be a meritocracy, leading, you know, you know creating sort of a more utopian uh, set of possibilities for our nation and the world, or we can be a meritocracy creating a more dystopian uh, society. And, uh, and our hope is that if we can um, su succeed at the challenge that we've given ourselves, that people will have to recognize ultimately that the choice is false, uh, that you can do both. Thank you. Thank you. 
How you doing, Mr. Jealous? My name's doing well. Ah, good. Hey, I am too. How are you? Good. My name's Brandon. I'm a first year uh, MPA student here okay. at SIPA. And you know, listening to you, a uh, question just kind of formed in my head. Yeah. And it's kind of the intersection of entrepreneurialism and uh, race and yeah. economics. So, you know, what are your thoughts on how, how do we shift the paradigm, especially among lower socioeconomic communities, communities of color? to embrace the idea of entrepreneurialism and not so much of you know going to school, getting a job, working for someone else. Sure. Because it seems like so many kids you know, have so many great ideas, but oftentimes they're put under the social construct that they're told that you know, this is not gonna make a living for you. Right. Don't do this. So what are your thoughts on getting past that? Well, I mean, look, I, I, there, are, there are many. I mean, we uh, at Caper Capital have something called the Caper Center for Social Impact, which is functionally our foundation. And we support, we created a program called SMASH, the Summer Math and Science Honors Program, where we go to schools that are typically 100% free and reduced lunch. We ask them for their B and C students with promise. We don't want the A students because there's always somebody else looking for the A students. Um, and, uh, and we take them for three years, uh, 15 weeks in total, five weeks every summer after freshman year, sophomore, junior year. And it's a high school enrichment program that's focused on STEM, but every child in there comes out knowing computer science and knowing how to start and run a business. Um, in the culture of the Valley, the people who are your workers today are your competition tomorrow, right? People who are working at Google today are, are creating the next startup tomorrow. And so, and for blacks, Latinos, and women, uh, that pace is typically accelerated because the culture of the companies aren't very sticky for us. So we come in the front door and we run out the back door. And, uh, and so our thought is that we have to train these kids to be entrepreneurs, even if we want, you know, the plan is for them to go to college. We simply want them to be able to keep moving up um, beyond their first job. That's, that's one way to do it. You know, the other way to do it is just to recognize what we know is true about our community. This is part of what we're doing with the book Reach. You know, uh, if I said, you know, have you heard that black, the black men are more likely to be in prison, you'd raise your hand. If you heard of the, of the uh, um, achievement gap, you'd raise your hand. If I, you know, in most rooms, in most rooms, if I said, do you know the, uh, the percentage, uh, or sorry, the rate at which black men start small businesses, most people wouldn't raise their hand. If you said, if you, you know, do you, do you know where, you know, black men are, uh, for instance, among their likelihood to join the military, most folks don't know. Black men you know, are the most likely to join the military of any racial and gender group in the country. They also start small businesses at twice the national average and have done so for more than a decade. And so that's what I was talking about earlier about sort of poor neighborhoods and neighborhoods like my uh, cousins living in West Baltimore. The, uh, my great uncle I still go back to where my mom grew up. The um, hustling is just like synonymous with survival. And it's always been that way for our community. The high point for black entrepreneurialism wasn't the 90s when credit was relatively easy to acquire. It was the 1920s at the height of Jim Crow. If you look at W.B. Du Bois's research, when we had the greatest number of black uh, small business owners, many of them tenant farmers, but you know, people who were ultimately had their own operation. And, um, and so I think we have to stop seeing entrepreneurialism as something that you do after college. And we have to start seeing it as something that we train people to do in high school. Quite frankly, we help to retain people in high school by doing. Um, obviously, college always helps. But um, many of the best business people I know, uh, from my uncle to Bill Gates, didn't finish college. And we just got to embrace that and recognize for some people that will motivate them to finish college because that it will line up with their vision. And for other people, it will just mean that they can feed their children when they figure out that they're, they're not going to finish college. Thank you. Last question. Uh, Benjamin, uh, I guess I speak to a, for everybody. You are a great speaker. Well, thank you, you have a talent. You are, have a gift. Thank you. You may have heard that before. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you know that. I'm just yeah, but, no, but thank you. reminding you. I, I and also, you. I, I understand you are considering running for Senate, yeah. which would be um, a fantastic situation in Maryland. I happen to have my daughter living in Maryland, so I know Maryland yeah. quite well, Bethesda. Uh, but the point is, 
uh, I, you must run if you're not already. Oh, thank you. And if, if you, if you, uh, you know, put a strong campaign, go for it. Because sooner or later, you, you must be in the Senate or the House or somewhere because yeah. you have the talent. So can you describe a little bit about your Senate uh, ambitions yeah, and sure, how do you see that? Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, look, I'm very, um, first of all, let me tell you all just what, what happened to kind of give you the, the picture. So Barbara Mikulski, everybody expected would be in the Senate until Barbara, Barbara Mikulski left the planet or shortly before, sort of like Thurgood Marshall in the US uh, Supreme Court. Stay as long as she possibly could. Everybody also expected we would have a Democratic governor right now. Well, it appears, the only sense I can make of it, is that because a Republican won, she decided, well, God forbid anything happened, I might have a Republican choosing my successor. Because one day we wake up and the like, second only to pigs flying in Maryland, she's resigned. <laughs> and we love her, and she's been tremendous. My grandmother's known her you know, both of their entire professional lives, or at least Barbara's. Barbara was an was a intern for my grandma's good friend. <laughs> both social workers in Baltimore. And, um, and all of a sudden, like the state was just, everybody's thinking about running for Senate. And then we look up and Harry Reid is about to coordinate Chris Van Hollen. Now Chris Van Hollen is an incredibly effective congressman. But this is the blackest state outside of Mississippi. And this is the seat, the first seat that a woman ever won in the US Senate. And in three days, they're trying to coordinate Chris Van Hollen for the seat. And so, press called me, said, are you interested? I said, sure, I'm interested. Like, let's just slow down for a second. Uh, if only to, to, to just kind of raise a specter that there's a whole set of potential leaders in Maryland who should be part of this conversation. That we shouldn't have a man from Nevada trying to choose our senator three days after the one that was much beloved and, and we were all invested in her leadership has just resigned. I um, am am very interested in going back into public service one day, and probably not as an organizer, probably in office. Right now, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. My partners said that they would s support me in running for Senate, um, but I looked at my two-year-old son and decided that before I run for anything, I want to make sure that he knows how to throw a baseball. <laughs> and so um, I'm going to hold off for a bit. But I, uh, I really appreciate that encouragement. And I do think you know, that... Uh, we really need to be encouraging more young people uh, and more people who are bridge builders um, to run for office. You know, this is going to be an incredible century. Um, and I have every belief that our nation can prosper as much in this century as we did in the last century, be as transformative and positive a presence as we were on the planet in many ways, obviously not in all ways in the last century. At least keep the trend going in the right direction. But uh, it's going to take... Uh, a new generation, frankly, of, of leaders who really um, see the natural connections between all of our, com our communities in a way that is easy and inherent and light for them. And that's what gives me you know, great hope about Maryland. I'm involved right now in supporting something called the New Georgia Project in Georgia and One Voice in Mississippi who are building multiracial coalitions, organizing voters from the bottom up to uh, uh, champion things like universal access to health care or early childhood education, creating coalitions across race lines and therefore party lines, but amongst basically poor people in each of those states. When I look at Maryland, uh, what, you know, it gives me actually great hope for where the, the, the South is headed. People, if your daughter's there, you've, you've dri probably driven through enough to understand you're driving into a southern state. It's below the Mason-Dixon. Frederick Douglass ran away from Maryland. Harriet Tubman ran away like a dozen times from Maryland. Um, and uh, it would have seceded if Lincoln hadn't violated the habeas corpus rates of several state uh, reps and had them all locked up before they could vote for secession. So that's where you are when you come into Maryland. And yet in Maryland in 2013, I'll close on this. In 2013, we abolished the death penalty, passed marriage equality, passed the DREAM Act, expanding, expanded voting rights protections in a year that they were being attacked elsewhere, and passed sensible gun safety reform. And as the guy who was the co-chair of the successful campaign to pass the DREAM Act and spearheaded the efforts to abolish, the successful efforts to abolish the death penalty, and uh, was, you know, um, 
and, and was one of the second tier of leaders kind of help co-lead the, the successful campaign to pass marriage equality. What I will tell you is that we decided that no longer would we let them triangulate us. No longer would we let them tell us, oh, you have to be, stand in line. This group gets their issue this session, your issues next session, and a decade from now, well, we might get to the transgender people over there, but we told you that like three decades ago, so just chill out for a bit. <laughs> you know, that's the game, right? One minority at a time. Please don't all come asking for stuff at once. Well, <laughs> well, we were able to point to all these other states in the country where all of us were being attacked all at once and say, you know, that's what this gets us. You keep separating us, we get vulnerable, they'll come after all of us. So no, we're not gonna do uh, alternative A, which historically has been, um, we each stay in our own silo and push our own issue and only get but so far. No, we're gonna adopt the motto of the three musketeers and simply say one for all and all for one, let's go. Because when you put the DREAM Act into play, well, you get a whole set of young people who are totally motivated and their parents. When you put uh, abolishing the death penalty into play, the same thing happens. Kind of young and old idealists come out of the woodworks. You know, and then you throw on voting rights and gun safety reform uh, you know, and marriage equality, and like, who can beat us? And it turns out nobody. And that's the politics that the generation of students who are in this room have the capacity to unleash. Uh, that's what this country is all about. You know, Frederick Douglass, who I talked about earlier, his speech, Our Composite Nationality, which was really his championing the rights of the Chinese. It was his tirade against the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I would encourage you to read it. But he gets down to the end of it, and he says this, and I'll, and I'll leave you on this thought. He says, and I really will leave. I have to run to the airport for a 3.30 flight. But he says, um, he says uh, every nation has a unique destiny. And its destiny is defined by its character. And its character, and think about how generous these words are for a former slave who had been tortured quite mercilessly. And its character is defined by that nation at its best, not its worst. worst. And that character is typically shaped by its geography. This is a paraphrase, because you listen to people who spoke in the 19th century, you want to paraphrase them. And he says, <coughs> and our geography is unique. We're bordered north and south by friendly nations of different races, and east and west by oceans that connect us to the rest of the world. And therefore, our destiny, based on our character, defined by us at our best, and shaped by that unique geography, and this part is an exact quote, is, is to be, quote, the most perfect example of the unity and dignity of the human family that the world has ever seen. Please don't let anybody convince you that our only option is dystopia, or that success depends on maintaining the meritocracy that says we only recruit from seven schools and two races and one gender. Always bring your, your inherent self, your better angels to the table with force and say no. The formula of that, that our nation, its highest principles from the beginning, despite what the, the reality was, has always been that inclusion and democracy and true meritocracy yield better results than any of us at any given moment can possibly believe or possible based on the facts at hand. In other words, it is not just uh, our formula for success, it is our faith as a nation. We need you, we need the young people in this room, the students in this room, and the professors in this room more than ever to really bolster that faith because we will be tested over the next three decades. We are moving to a place where we will all only be minorities. There are two ways that can go. One of them is really bad, and one of them is what Frederick Douglass described, the most perfect example of the unity and dignity of the human family that the world has seen. Let us make that the reality for our children. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been great to have you with us. Really a pleasure. We're a school that not only studies issues but engages them. So fabulous to have you with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much. Thank you guys.